Okay, thank you. So, hello everyone, thank you for coming. And today I'm going to talk about the work that I have been doing in my last two years in the PhD. And as you can read here, uh, the I am focus on the inhibition, or the role of the inhibition in a neural circuit, in particular in the dentine gyrus. Okay? So, well, for who doesn't know what is the inhibition or the excitation, when I have two uh, neurons, okay, the presynaptic neuron and the postsynaptic neuron, when the presynaptic neuron is an excitatory neuron, helps to the postsynaptic neurons to be activated. However, I have the opposite case when the presynaptic neuron is an inhibitory neuron. Okay, so just uh, I will explain a little bit uh, the structure when we are studying that effect that is the hippocampus and uh, one neural circuit that is the dental gyrus that is a region inside that hippocampus. Then I will explain the motivation of the model, why we wa why we have to do a model of that circuit, and. Uh, continue explaining the model of the dentine gyrus, the results that we obtain, and uh, the part of the in vitro experiments that I am doing in the Institute of Alicante. And at the end, the conclusions and the future work. So, let me to start talking about the hippocampus. All this structure that we can see here was called by Julius Cesare as hippocampus due to the similitude with the seahorse. Okay? This name comes from the Latin, and hippo means horse, and campus means monster, okay? And basically is that similitude. In our brain, we have the hippocampus in the temporal lobe, and it's a component of the limbic system. So in human brains and um, primates brain, uh, we have the hippocampus here and another part, the symmetric part in another hemisphere, and in rats and mice, we, the structure is, has that form, okay? And it's symmetric for the another hemisphere. The most important of that uh, structure basically is that it's very, it's related to the memory consolidation, the spatial memory and the orientation, and in functions like pattern separations. If we talk about diseases, this, this structure is related to Alzheimer, amnesia, and epilepsy. So, if we talk about in the, the regions that that hippocampus has inside, uh, we can see that we have the internal cortex, okay? Uh, basically, this is the input to all the circuit, the hippocampus. So the information comes from the internal cortex to the dental gyrus, okay? That is all this structure here. The dental gyrus projects the information to the CA3, okay? That the CA3 is all this region of here. Then the CA3 projects to CA1, that is all this structure, and then C1 projects to the subiculum, and the subiculum again projects to the internal cortex. Okay, so here we have the subiculum, and the subiculum projects again to the internal cortex. So we can see here that we have a closed circuit where the information is transmitted uh, through that axons, that, that axon here are called perforant pathway, to the dental gyrus. C3, C1, and arrive again to the internal cortex. So the most important input that we have is the internal cortex that comes the axon in that direction and go to the dental gyrus and goes through the perforant pathway. All these axons that arrive here are called perforant pathway. Okay? And we are focused in this structure here. And this structure has mm, three different regions has three layers, an external layer, then a middle layer, and then an uh, inner region. So the most important layer is the granular layer that is in the middle, where we have more or less one million of granular cells okay, in a rat. That cells are very, per are very peculiar because are very difficult to, to activate it. But when the neuron is activated, we can be sure that the, tra that the information is transmitted to the whole region of the C3, okay? Then we have the molecular layer that is the external layer of that dental gyrus, where we have the dendrites of the granule cells. So in that layer, we have the connections between the perforant pathway, the information that comes from the internal cortex 
to the granular cells, and then we have inhibitor interneurons. And at the end, we have the inner region of that dentine gyrus that is constituted by inhibitory and excitatory interneurons. In particular, here we have one cell that are called parvalumin cells, and that parvalumin cells has the, the role to control with inhibition that granular cells of here. Okay? So this is the structure, and this is the circuit, and this is the region that we are focused. Why? Okay. So now I will explain the motivation of the model. So before to explain the motivation of the model, I first have, well, I have to explain what is the LTP, okay? So the LTP is the long-term potentiation. If we can imagine a presynaptic neuron, a yana postsynaptic neuron, here we have a synapse, okay? Here we have a connection. So the presynaptic neuron has neurotransmitters that releases to the, to the postsynaptic neuron. And the postsynaptic, the postsynaptic neuron has the neuroreceptors that can, can catch the neurotransmitters. And then we have a postsynaptic signal, okay? Depending on the, the ring of the presynaptic neuron generating spikes, sometimes can occur that these synapses can be potentiated. So the presynaptic neuron has more neurotransmitters and the postsynaptic neuron has more neuroreceptors, okay? So the previous, synap the previous signal is potentiated, okay? This process is very important for memory consolidation or learning processes. So, in one experiment uh, that is published by Santiago Canals, uh, here we have a resonant image, and here we can see that when they stimulate the perforant pathway, the input to the hippocampus, in that resonance we can see that that region of here, that basically is the hippocampus, is activated. Okay? They did an LTP in the same perforant pathway and did again another stimulation. And after that stimulation, after the LTP, the result is that that hippocampus is more activated, but then there are different regions very far of that hippocampus that are activated too. So that LTP has been has doing something that at the end there is a remote a remodelation of the neural of the um, functional network and then we can send information to different regions of the brain okay so to understand what happens here they do they did another type of experiment so this is the scheme of the experiment that they did and here we have the hippocampus you know right and this is the dental gyrus here we have the perforant pathway okay that is the input that comes from the antorneal cortex. They put here an electrode to stimulate the axons that arrive to the dental gyrus, and then here put another electrode to record the LFP. The LFP is the local field potential, okay? That is the electrical field that there is in that different rate, in that different zones, okay? So we, have, we can have here 32 channels, okay? 32 records of the LFP. But in my case, the most important part is the region of the dental gyrus because it's the first structure that receives the information from the perforant pathway. Okay, so uh, they have that LFP, but with independent component analysis, can split that 32 channels of LFP in independent components, in independent signals. Okay, and in particular, here we have two independent signals. One, the perforant pathway generator, and another one, the ELAR generator. The perforant pathway generator comes from that region here, okay? And the ELAR generator comes from the region of the ILUS, the inside, the re inside region of the dental gyrus, <coughs> okay? So the composition of both signals at the end complete the LFP. Okay, we know that this part of here is an excitatory contribution and this region here, this signal here, is an inhibitory contribution, okay? We can know that because with uh, different substances that we can block the inhibition, the power of that signal decreases. So the major contribution of that inhibition, of that signal, is the inhibition. Okay, so the experiment was the following. Well, here I have one scheme, 
to see very easy that we have the internal cortex here, the perforant powers projects to the ground layer, okay, this red zone, and projects to the ilar region, the green zone. And then here we have the parabolumin cells that inhibit the granular cells in the populations. Okay? And they do an LTP in the perforant power. So they do the LTP here. Okay? And they compare the amplitude of that evoke. Okay? They generate a stimulation here with the electrode. And this is the response that they obtain in the last bit and separate mm, and split it in two signals. This is the first contribution that comes from the excitation, and this is the another contribution that comes from the inhibition. So when they did an LTP here, that peak that comes from the inhibition disappears. Okay? So we can see here that the amplitude ratio between these two evocates increases after the LTP. So basically, this means that the excitation increases, but the inhibitions, the fifth forward inhibition that go from that region to the granular cells decreases. And moreover, when compute the correlation between both signals decreases too. Okay? And it's a little bit strange that when we are doing the LTP here, so we can think that we are potentiated or the input, okay? We can understand that the excitation increases. But we, it's very difficult to understand what happens here and why we are depressing the inhibition okay? that go from that ilar region to the granular cells. So for this reason, we wanted to do a model to try to simulate all this structure, simulate the effect of the LTP, and see what happens in the model to try to find an answer to that mm, results, experimental results. OK, so we started with the model. And the model, uh, what well, I will talk about uh, the individual neurons of the model. So I use the Ithekevich model to simulate individual neurons. The Ithekevich model is constituted by two equations, one fast variable, another uh, slow variable, that is the U, that is the recall variable of the membrane potential. Okay? V is the membrane potential of the neuron. And this equation, oh, well, this model is a discontinuous model. So I have to reset the model. The advantage of this model is that changing the parameters A, B, C, and D, I can generate different type of dynamics. Okay? So I can do a neuron, a fast spiking neuron, a regular spiking neuron, or a tonic bursting neuron. And this is very important for me because if I want to do a model with different type of neurons, with a simple uh, model like the Fekevich, just changing the parameters A, B, C, and D, I can get that different type of neurons. Okay, another contribution that I put in that model is the, um, the Poisson noise. So each neuron in my model has a Poisson noise that basically is that each neuron has excitatory inputs that is to simulate the, um, the external noise that I don't take into account in my model. Okay, so in that, uh, that excitatory input basically are uh, events that arrive to my neuron with a Poisson distribution and each event generates a synapsis, okay? a synaptic current. And the synaptic current follows that equation that basically is the conductance times R times the difference between the membrane potential of the neuron and the reverse reversal potential of the, ne of the synapsis. So this parameter depends on the type of the synapsis. <coughs> We use AMPA, NMDA, and GABA. AMPA and NMDA are excitatory synapses. So it helps to spike, to generate, to activate the postsynaptic neuron. The difference between AMPA and NMDA is that this is faster than that. And GABA is the, the inhibitory synapses. So the difference here is that that reversal potential from the, for the inhibitory synapses is minus 75 millivolts, and for excitatory synapses are 0 millivolts. Okay. And the R basically is the dynamic of the neurotransmitters in the synaptic process. So basically it represents the probability that the presynaptic neuron can, can release neurotransmitters and the postsynaptic neuron can catch that, neuro, that neurotransmitters. And that uh, time is the decay time because basically this is uh, exponential that increases the, the probability when the presynaptic neuron generates an spike. So, 
uh, this is a uh, exponential that decay with the time uh, tau k that depends on the synapses. For instance, for AMPA is 5.6 milliseconds, and for NDA is 100 or 200 milliseconds. So this is the synapses uh, from uh, the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. Okay, so I have to build a model with population of that is the Kevich neurons, but I have to satisfy mm, different conditions, experimental conditions. The conditions from the literature, from uh, experimental evidences, and the third one is the frequency of its populations. Okay, so for instance, we know that the tonical cortex work in a theta frequency. A theta frequency is a range between three and ten hertz. That ILA region works in a gamma frequency that is between 20 and 60 hertz. And the granular layer, the granular cells, okay, works in a theta and a gamma, and a combination of both frequencies. Okay? And another part that comes from this experiment that is from a paper of Peter Jonas, that, uh, well, in, they did an experiment, a difficult experiment. This is a registration in, in life. And we have the LFP, the local field potential, and the intracellular current. So they uh, achieve, uh, arrive inside one neuron, a can register, and they can register the inhibitory postsynaptic current inside the neuron and the excitatory postsynaptic current. And they compare and they compute the cohesions between that intracellular current and the local field potential, the external field potential. So. Uh, they saw that, for instance, when computer coherence with the inhibition and the local field potential in that population, there is an important peak in gamma. So this means that that inhibition that arrived to the granular cells arrived in a gamma region. Okay, so arrived from this population here. However, when they compared the coherence with uh, between the excitation and the local field potential, the peak coherence is in theta. So that, in, that excitations, we can say, that arrive from the toronial cortex. So these coherences of here and the frequency of each population are my conditions to fit the model. So the first model that I did was very simple because I used three populations, the toronial cortex, the granular cells, and the ILAR region that are probably means interneurons. Okay? And the parameters that I can use to fit the model are the connectivity, that in my model the neurons are connected randomly with a given probability P. So I have a given probability for the population and the connectivity between populations. So changing the probability, uh, I can change the dynamics of all the circuits. And then the another, par the another parameter that I can change is the synaptic conductance. So is this value of here. Basic Basically, I play with the amplitude or the intensity of the current that arrives to the postsynaptic neuron. So changing the parameters with this model, I achieve to obtain the, um, the initial con well, the conditions, the previous conditions. But when I try to, be, to see what happens with the LTP, it was impossible to see uh, the, simi the, the same results that in the experiment that we want to find. So at the end, we need we thought that we need something more here. And now this is the, the model, that the circuit that I have built. So we have add more connections and more populations. So we have the input that is the internal cortex. So here I have 200 neurons, where 80% of that, of that population are excitatory neurons, and then 20% are inhibitory neurons. Then this internal cortex sends information to the granular cells and the paralumin cells. Okay, that inhibitory interneuron stroke, the perforant power, that basically are synapses, AMPA, and NDI, excitatory synapses. Then, in that population, I have 500 granular cells, where the 65% of that population can generate bars, so packets of spikes, in a given period, and the 35% can, can generate regular spikes. This data comes from the literature, from the from the same paper of the, of the Peter Jonas. And then here we have uh, one population of inhibition that inhibit that granular cells. 
And then another population of interneurons. These interneurons are excitatory interneurons. So excite the populations, this and this another one. And then we have this population here that are healing interneurons, that, uh, that they are one type of interneuron that just inhibit interneurons. Okay? No, inhibit the main neurons that are in that case the granular cells. Okay, all my interneurons are fast spiking neurons. Here we have that contribution, and here are uh, regular spiking neurons. And the contribution of the inhibition of that 20% are fast spiking neurons. So, with this model fitting the same parameters, the probability of connectivity and the wave of that uh, synaptic conductance was more complicated because we have more connections here, but at the end, we obtain that conditions. So, when we talk about the power spectrum of this population, we can see that the internal cortex has a peak in theta, but this is easy because I fit the population to obtain that because I don't care about how appears, well, I know how appears that peak, but basically the neural cortex is the input to my important circuit, that is the dental gyrus. Then we have the contribution of the interneurons from the ILUS that we have the part of the inhibition and the part of the MOSI cells that work in a gamma frequency, so around 50 hertz, more or less. And then we have the granular cells, the power spectrum of the granular cells that has an important peak in theta that comes from the internal cortex, and then the region, uh, little region in gamma that arise due to that interneurons. And then when we compare the coherence, these are the results with the model and this with the comparing with the experiment of Peter Jonas. And we can see here that if we compare the citatory current that arrived to my granular cells in my model with the LFP, the coherence has a peak in theta, like in the experiment, and if I compare the inhibitory current that arrived to my granular cells to the LFP, I have a region in gamma. <coughs> okay, so we can believe in the model more or less, so we can continue, and we want to, yes? Sorry, uh, can you give more, more details on how do you perform the, the fitting? I mean, you, uh, I guess I think the, the previous transparency of the number of new roads that you have in every region, do you assume that all I mean, you fit to the parameters of every neuron, or you have the case that the, you have a, let's say, a Gaussian distribution? No, no, no. I, I, well, I started with, uh, with the values of the literature, more or less, mm -hmm. and then I regulate the values of that in that connectivities, because, for instance, uh, if, I, if I see that I have an important power spectrum in theta, I know that arrive from the populations, so maybe I, have, I need more contribution of that region of here. So I have to increase the conductance, or maybe I have to increase the probability of connectivity to have more influence of the gamma region that comes from this region. Okay, so I have to play depending on the result that I can see after. So I do the simulation with the given parameters, I do the analysis, and then I see the result. And then after that result, I have to choose what parameters I have to change. Because here we have many connections between them, and depending if I change that connectivity, maybe change a lot of things in that population. The GC, the, the GLAP, uh, is global, are... The GC, the grammar set. So you have 500, you have the values of the, uh, the literature. I guess yes. this is an interval. So within this interval, you, you assume a distribution, I mean, uh, half of them are one value, half another value, or a Gaussian, or, or, or how do you do? Uh, well, basically is that I choose that, as I said in the connectivity, for instance, one cell of that population is connected with a given probability, uh, for instance, the 20% with all neurons in that population, randomly. Okay? So I don't achieve, I don't fit for a one distribution. I can do it, but uh, basically the connection here is random. So I basically, if I have one neuron here, so each neuron is connected to a 20% of that population, randomly, without distribution. Okay, I see that there's a lot of <laughs> details. Uh, okay, okay. we can move to it later. Okay, so uh, the way that we simulate the LTP basically is changing, so 
the LTP changes the conductance of the, in the synapses. So we do the same. So we change the conductance in the model, and we can see after the LTP what happens. So we compare the effect pre-LTP and the network post-LTP. So this is um, the similitude with the experiments. So here we compute the ratio between the inhibition and the excitation that arrive to the granule cells. And here we compare the correlation between the signal, the inhibitory signal, and the excitatory signal. Okay. So in the control case, if we doesn't change nothing about in the model, we we'll have that values, and uh, we think different hypotheses that can change the LTP. Okay. One hypothesis is that in the connection between the parvalumin cells and the granule cells, here in that synapse, there is a depression. So we reduce the conductance in these synapses. And doing that, we can see that the, the ratio between the inhibition and the excitation decreases, but this is expected because we are decreasing the inhibition. However, the correlation is very similar. Another hypothesis that we can think is that, okay, this is the logical hypothesis that if we potentiate, do an LTP here, we potentiate the input from the internal cortex to granular cells, and from the internal cortex to the parvalumin cells. In that case, we can see that the ratio decreases and the correlation decreases too. However, we have different conditions. For instance, if just potentiate the input from the internal cortex to granular cells, we have the same mm, behavior. And doing a potentiation here and a depression between internal cortex and parvalumin cells, we have similar results. So, we can see that doing the LTP in the model, the inhibition of the ground cells decreases, the excitation of the ground cells increases, and the correlation between the excitation and the inhibition decreases. The problem is that we have different possibilities to obtain that result. Okay? So this is one reason that I have to do the in vitro experiments. However, to continue to think, to, to see what happens in the model, we choose one of them. Okay? In that case, we choose this case when we potentiate the input from internal cortex to granular cells and uh, the input from internal cortex to parvalumin cells because it's the parsimonious case. When we are doing the LTP here, we can think that we are potentiated all these inputs. Okay, so if we do that, we can see the firing rate of each population. Okay, and with this plot, we can see that, well, the blue is pre-LTP and the red is post-LTP. And in the model, we can see that the population of granular cells are more activated, the firing rate increases. The firing rate of that inhibitor interneurons that inhibit other interneurons increases too. And the population of the parvalumin cells that inhibit the granular cells, the firing rate decreases. So basically, that activation of granular cells activate more Hill cells, and that Hill cells inhibit the parvalumin cells. So at the end, we have a depression of the inhibition over the granular cells. Basically, when appears the LTP, we can see that we have a temporal window where the inhibition is reduced. And the model is saying that that inhibition is reduced due to the network. Okay? Here we have the same, but with the excitatory currents. So we can see that pre-LTP, this is the excitatory current in the granular population of post LTP increases. However, with the inhibitory current, uh, the blue is pre-LTP, but post LTP decreases that, uh, that inhibition. And for the uh, population of parvalumin cells, increases post LTP the excitation, but increases to the inhibition. Okay? So another question is if we have the minimal circuit to explain that. Okay? So to, do, to answer that question, Basically, we compute the same, but removing populations. So we remove, in that case, the population of MOSIT cells, and we can see that the effect of the decreasement of the radio between the inhibition and the excitations appears again. However, if we remove the Hill cells, we lost that information. So the Hill cells are the most important to inhibit the parvalumin cells, and then the inhibition of our granular cells decreases in that case. However, if we compute the correlations, if we remove the MOSIT cells or if we remove the Hill cells, 
we cannot change the correlation. So at the end, to reproduce the experimental results, we need both, both populations. So this is the minimal circuit to try to explain what happens when we are, when we are doing an LTP in the dental gyrus, well, in the perforant pathway. OK, so one time we have uh, this model, we can try to predict something more. So this is another type of experiment that, uh, well, this experiment has been done in the laboratory of Santiago Canals. And in this experiment, they use transgenic mice. The advantage of that is that we can manipulate that parvalbumin neurons. So we can depress that neurons or we can activate them. So here we have the experiment plots and the model plots. Okay? The control case is the mouse without <coughs> nothing. And then the yellow is when we are depressing the population of parvalbumin cells. So we work here in the experiment with the same signal, the generator of the perforant pathway and the generator of the ILUS. And we can see that if we uh, depress the paralumin cells or if we don't depress the paralumin cells, the power spectrum of the excitation is equal. But however, with the inhibition, we can see in the experiment that decreases when we depress the paralumin cells, that is the yellow, decreases in a, theta, in a gamma frequency, okay, between 30 and 50 hertz, okay? The power spectrum of the signal decreases. If we compare with the model, I can depress uh, the populations in the model easily, and we have the same result, that uh, the power spectrum of the excitatory current doesn't change. However, uh, the inhibitory current the, is depressed, the region, the peak in gamma is depressed. And if we compare the coherence between the perform pa the perform pathway generator and the illus, so the excitation and the inhibitions, when we depress in the animal the paralumin cells, we have here that changes in the gamma frequency, and in my, mo in my model, I have the same. So we have a model that is fitted with uh, experimental data that is published, then uh, we can answer some questions about the LTP, and we can use the model to predict another effects that we can see in different experiments. The problem, as I said before, is that we have more than one possibility to explain that effect. So for this reason, I have to do in vitro experiments. Okay. So uh, I started the last year in this part, and the most important thing in the in vitro experiments is the technique of whole cell patch clamp. So basically, it's a technique to register intracellular ionic currents in one neuron, okay, in individual neurons. The technique is simply to explain, but difficult to do it. So here we have the pipette, and this is the electrode inside the pipette. So we arrive to the neuron, and the whole cell patch clamp basically is to break the membrane of the neuron, and that membrane of the neuron is, paid, is pasted in, in, the, in the pipe. So in that, in that case, I can see all the ionic currents inside the neuron, and I can control the neuron. I can control it with two modes. One mode is the voltage clamp. With the voltage clamp, I clamp the neuron to a given voltage, minus 75 millivolts, for instance, or zero millivolts. And with that clamp, I can see the excitatory and inhibitory current that arrive to one neuron. So for instance, here, uh, when I stimulate the perforant pathway, I can see that this is the excitatory current that arrives to my neuron. For instance, this is the same, but this is the spontaneous signal. So if I don't stimulate nothing, uh, the slice is activated as a basal state, and these are the evocates that appear. Okay? The another mode is the current clamp. The current clamp, I clamp the current. Okay? I put a current to the neuron, and I can see the membrane potential of the neuron. So with a given current, I can see how generate the spikes. Okay? For instance, this is the spiking regime of a parvalumin cell. OK, so when I, talk, when I say that I have to patch a neuron, basically it's to do that technique of here. Okay. So the objective of the experiment, 
why I have to do in vitro experiments. So the objective is basically to patch a porvalumin cell, that is the neuron that I am working, and see what happens with the excitatory current and the inhibitory current before and after the LTP. So I have to generate an LTP in the, in the molecular layer here, and then I have to see the current that arrives to the parvalumin cell. So if my model is correct after the LTP, I have to say that the inhibition, the inhibitory current, is smaller after the LTP, okay? If my model is correct. Okay, so to be sure that we are, we are doing the LTP, then we have here another pipette that we can record uh, extracellular, uh, well, we can do extracellular recordings. So basically it's here, I put the pipette and register the local field potential in all this region of here, okay? Okay, the problem is that it's very difficult to find the parvalumin cells in the tissue. So, uh, we use a transgenic mice that with fluorescent slide, we can see that points of here are the parvalumin cells, okay? So, with that transgenic mice, I can find the neurons using fluorescent lamp, a fluorescent lamp. With a blue light, I can see that neurons, okay? So, the problem is that for one slide, we have a few parvalumin cells, okay? But before to do that experiment, we have to satisfy some conditions and some controls, okay? And here we have the problems. <coughs> so, uh, the conditions are that I have to use the adult mice, okay? Because I need the complete network, and uh, for adult mice, it's very difficult to patch the neuron. The membrane is harder. Then, we had problems with the solution. When I started, we used uh, different solutions because all the process, when I extract the brain and when I do the experiment, we are using constantly different solutions for, to keep in, for keeping alive the, the neurons. And, um, well, we had problems with the uh, first solutions and three months ago, we started with another one and now it's better. Then we need a temperature in the registration around 32 and 35 degrees. So when I'm doing the experiment, the slice is always with a fluid with a HSF perfusion, and that HSF has to be between 32 and 35 degrees. Then I cannot use antagonist GABA. Okay, the antagonist GABA is the substance that blocks the inhibition. And I say that because the LTP, produce an LTP here in the experiment in a slice is very difficult. We have uh, an important local inhibition in our granular cells, so when we are stimulated in not the same that when the animal is alive, that we have all the brain. So in the slide, we have more inhibition over the granular cells than the excitation. So it's very complicated to do an LTP. The problem, well, people work with antagonist GABA to block that inhibition and then they can achieve that potentiation in the granular cells. The problem is that I want to study the inhibition, so I cannot block that inhibition. So here is a little bit diffi uh, difficult for us. Then in the process of to treat the brain, we have to cut the brain in a given um, position. So depending how you can destroy the brain, you can destroy it a little bit. So uh, this is another point to take into account for the experiment. And then we have to be ensured that we are, are activating the, the network. And then the, the, another difficulty is, the, is to patch parabolumin cells because the neurons are, are few in their life and they are very delicate. Sometimes you arrive with the pipette and when you try to break the membrane, it explodes. So, what? Well, a little bit difficult. So here, this is, uh, well, I, I don't, don't know if you can see. At the beginning, I see nothing, but now I can identify different type of neurons here. So here, there is a granular cell. This region is the granular cell, so we are patching here one granular cell. And we can see different colors. So this ray of black of here is the molecular layer, when usually I put the stimulation here. This zone of here, is uh, the granular cells layer. So here we have all granular cells. And then in this region of here, that is difficult to see what there are here. This is the illusion, okay? So the idea to be the controls, 
course, we have to be sure that we can generate the LTP in granular cells. So I have to batch one granular cell. Uh, I have to put another uh, pipette here to do the extra extracellular recordings. And then I have to stimulate in, in the perforant pathway, in the region of the molecular layer. And I have to achieve an LTP of potentiation. Then I have to find uh, with this protocol, we do two stimulations. So the first stimulation is to activate the circuit. So we have to be ensured that we are activating the circuit with that first stimulation. And then the second stimulation is to be the effect in the neuron when the circuit is activated. The problem is that we have to find the time delay between both inputs to be ensured that when we are stimulating in the second time, we are in the uh, region where the circuit is activated, and then we have to find the optimal intensity. Uh, this optimal intensity is a little bit difficult because depending on the day, depending on the slice, on the neuron, depending on if you can catch more axons, you can recruit more axons from the perforant pathway, or depending on you, your slice, mm, sometimes you don't have signal here. Okay, so all of these experiments I have to do it with this. This is my setup. So I am working when I can extract the brain and I have the slices. I put the lights here. And we have here, this is the camera, this is the microscope. Here we have three mi mi micro manipulators. When we have the electrodes here with the pipette, this is the, the, the micro manipulator that, hold, that has the, the stimulation, the electrode that stimulates the slice, and with this both micro manipulation, I can do the records. And here we can do electrical stimulation, optogenetic stimulation, and this is very good because I can stimulate with the light, and I can stimulate zones with a high precision. I can stimulate one neuron, or I can stimulate uh, mm. the input to one neuron, and this is fine because. Basically, when you are using optogenetics, you have injected a virus to the mouse. So just you are activating the, the target of your neurons. <coughs> so you can, mm, you can put the light in one region, but just activates a given type of neurons. When you are using the electrical stimulation, you are stimulating all the region that you are putting the, the current. So with that uh, setup, we can do patch clamp techniques. We can use calcium imaging with that camera, and we have a lamp to see to use the fluorescence imaging. And for this reason, I can see the parvalumin cells. Okay, so these uh, are my well, the last one, the some, something that I I cannot think from the experiment. So are basically control experiments. So now I can obtain, uh, for instance, that are extracellular recordings. And the extracellular recordings, this is uh, the pipette is in the granular layer. So we can see if the neurons are activated or not. For instance, pre-LTP, we have that peak. That, that peak basically is the activation of the populations. And after the LTP, we can see that that peak is transformed in another very higher and it's faster, appears before. So we are potentiating that input from the perforant pathway and we can activate with the same current that before more neurons, okay? So mm, we are achieving uh, an LTP in the slice with a antagonist GABA, so this is a, a good result. And then we have the same with in the intracellular granular cell recordings. So, well, this is the evocate. We generate here the stimulation, and this is the result. And we can see here that pre-LTP, we have a given amplitude of that evocate. And after the LTP, that amplitude increases a lot, around 50 minutes, and then continues, decreases a little bit, but continues higher than in pre-LTP. So, for the experimental controls, we are obtaining good results. And the next part will be uh, to try to patch for volume cells to see what happens in the experiment. So, to conclude, I will. Uh, what I have a model that the model is fitted with the experimental data that is published. With this model, 
with that minimal circuit, I can explain the effect of the LTP in the dentite gyrus. Moreover, uh, we can use the model to do different type of predictions, like uh, the experimental, uh, the experiment with transgenic mice. And then uh, the problem is that with this model, I have different uh, possibilities to obtain the same results. So for this reason, I have to do the in vitro experiment. Okay. The problem is that the in vitro experiments is uh, well, it's very difficult, and we had problems, but we are working on that. So the next point, basically is to answer the question, why is the brain using that mechanism? So if we find the mechanisms that the brain is using when appears the LTP, so there is a network that at the end there is a group of inhibitor interneurons that inhibit the, inhib the inhibition over the granule cells. So if that is the mechanism, and we can see the hypothesis, the correct hypothesis that mm, explain the model with the in vitro experiments, the next part is to think why the brain is using that model uh, or that F, that mechanism and, no, uh, and not another one. So to see, to investigate that part, uh, we want to put, uh, well, we want to use the model to do pattern separations. So we want to put a pattern in the internal cortex and to see what happens in the population of granular cells and if the effect of the LFP is better for pattern separations or maybe for memory consolidation or maybe just this LTP is good to improve the transmission of the information between the internal cortex to CH3 and to different regions of the brain. Okay, so just this the, the answer of my thesis that I want to and that I hope to explain at the end. And just thank you to Claudio and Santiago Bernal, my co-directors. Andres Parra, who teaches me all about the uh, in vitro experiments. Uh, Victor, that uh, maybe who about here know him, that is uh, very good doing uh, analysis of experimental data and he helped me a lot. And Antonio Ferrat, that has been working with me doing the in vitro experiments and surgeries in mice. And at the end, the laboratory of Santiago Ganal, that they helped me a lot. And thank you for your attention. In vitro is not the same than in vivo. <laughs> we see differences in respect to that will be between the two kinds of experiments. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry? Doing experiments in vitro, in vitro, mm -hmm. is not the same as doing them in vivo. Yes, yes, what? I know. Uh, I know that the problem. A lot of signals around yes. that, so if you can comment. Yes, the problem is, is that. To check the, the result of the experiment, we need something from the network. And in vivo, it's very difficult to find that. However, in vitro, we know that it's not the same, and this is, well, a uh, tricky point. But in in vitro, we can find something about the network. In the slides, we have the structure very well, and we can know that if we are uh, recording the granular cells, we can see that the inhibitions come from that parvalumin cells and we can see the parvalumin cells and we can pass. So the information that give us the, the model, just we can test it with the in vitro experiment. It's not the same, it's true, but at the end we, we have the same results. Uh, we can associate the in vitro experiment with the model, with the network, basically. So for this reason, we can use the in vitro experiment because it's more related with the network. And just a curiosity, not related to the previous one. You mentioned this uh, uh, translated, uh, transgenic line of, of, of mice, I mean, with the, with the uh, GFP, I mean, the, the, the blue one, I mean, the, uh, is it uh, has it been produced in the, in the lab or is it? Uh, well, in that institute, we have transgenic mice, and yes, and then we have, uh, well, the first mouse maybe is by it, but at the end we can reproduce the mice and we can get it. Because having that just this parvalumin, parvalumin cells, whatever cells yes. are, are yes, so applied, I mean, uh, I, I, guess I, I mean, it's not trivial, I mean. No, 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 so we have a line of mouse 
of mice that we, that that neurons are labeled, and then we can inject virus, and the virus just is expressed to the pavalumin cells. That the line of the mice is pavalumin cre, that that cre terminal that cre is expressed with the virus with the virus. So we have that line of mice, and we can work with that. For instance, in in, in, in vivo experiments, they can use that transgenic mice and they working with behavior experiments um, uh, the press in the paralumin cells uh, the, the mice is a little bit more silly no, more intelligent, sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay, I had a question about the, the probabilities in your model you, you mentioned that you had these different populations of cells and you had some probabilities of connection Mm -hmm. So when you present your results, these are average results of over many runs, let's say. Or no, it's a run, it's an average. I have to do a study. Yes, I have to do a study. So I do many simulations. And after that, many simulations, changing that connectivity, with, but with the same probability. But always I reset the condition, so I have new connections. All you described to the segments you were showing in your bar. Yes, yes, yes. I so yes. Yeah, yes, yes. Um, <coughs> in the part where you talk about the minimum model, I'm not quite sure how you get to the conclusion, but the conclusion was basically that you need all these. Uh, yes, the conclusion is that I need all my population, the five population, because if I remove one of them, I lost the 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 experimental finding. So at the end is this is the minimal the minimal circuit that I need to use to obtain that experimental result. Okay, but then how what is actually the you said you move to the in vitro experiment because you with simulation you cannot uh, find a single hypothesis that would be correct, right? Mm -hmm. And what would be that multiple hypothesis? So, well, the problem is that the most important part in that hypothesis are the activation of granular cells. So, if I have the population of granular cells is more activated, then that activation activates the healing interneurons and can inhibit the paralumin cells. So, mm, at the end, if I can obtain the registrations in parvalumin cells, if after the LTP in the slides, I can see that I have more inhibition disease because there are another population of interneurons, inhibitory interneurons that inhibit more, are more activated, so inhibit more my parvalumin cell. So I have more inhibition. And in that way, if this happens, uh, if mm, with the, well, if this happens, I can say that the model is correct and with the inhibitory currents of granular cells I can see if the if the inhibition that are, that arrive right from granular cells is depressed or not and if there is an excitation and if the excitation between the perforant power that arrive to the granular cells is potentiated. So for instance I can see that for in, in paralumin cells I have the registration of excitatory current after the LTP is potentiated too. So I can say that I have, mm, when I do an LTP, it's potentiated the inputs that arrive to granular cells and the inputs that arrive to parvalumin cells. So this is one hypothesis in my model. So I can discriminate that maybe this is the correct answer because in my experiment, when I do the LTP, the excitatory current that arrives to my parvalumin cell increases too. Okay? If mm, instead of increase decreases that excitation, this is a depression. So maybe we are potentiating the input to granular cells, but depressing the input to parvalumin cells. And this is another hypothesis. Okay. So doing the in vitro experiments, I can fit or I can see what is the hypothesis. Okay. Okay. Uh, I also had a curiosity. It is not known what brain activity more involved with the hippocampus from the last uh, comment you mentioned. Uh, uh, for instance, the, uh, 
Mm, the most important contribution, the most important contribution is in learning processes when you are learning something, or when you are in a room, depending of the the ambient, if there are more objects or less objects, uh, that granular cell are more or less activated and works in the pattern separation. So, for instance, if we are here in a square, we have a given pattern in our brain that this is due to the activation of the granular cells or if the room is like a circle, so we have another pattern. So this uh, structure is very related with the ambient and with the memory consolidation of that mem and the spatial memory and the orientation. Okay, there are no more. Let's thank you.